Hey, I'm Sweeney Chad, and today we're going to be seeing if I can beat Kerbal Space Program 1 using aircraft only. We've added dozens of mods to the game, making it look and act completely differently. We have plane contracts and tons and tons of new launch sites to land our planes at around Kerbin. Beyond that, we have a massively expanded solar system with gas giants, dwarf planets, you name it, and even have the full near future and far future uh, mod suite, which is made by the same guy who is working as a dev at KSP2. And beyond that, we even have some interstellar stuff going on. A massive black hole with three star systems and its own planets to boot that we'll be able to visit much, much later in the series. So more or less, we have the exact same roadmap as KSP2, but in KSP1. As soon as we start up the game, I'm immediately hit with a wave of nostalgia because it really has been a long time since I've played career mode in KSP. I went ahead and enabled Plasma Blackout and Kerbal G-Force Limits because I love those. And then we're greeted with the familiar face of Gene Kerman. We're going to immediately go over to Mission Control to uh, get two contracts from him. We're going to grab launching our first vessel and gathering scientific data from Kerbin, which are the two easiest contracts to complete right off the bat with our first craft. As soon as we grab those, we're going to head over to the space plane hangar and begin work on our first craft. Once we're there, we're greeted by Werner von Kerman. And it's time to actually figure out how to build a plane with the parts that we have. We're only given very, very limited parts whenever you begin in KSP-1. In KSP-2, you get rocket engines and everything. You only get this little booster and these little tiny fins to start out KSP-1. And we're going to try to make this as much like an aircraft as possible and have it take off horizontally rather than vertically. So we're going to lower down the thrust weight to around one or a little bit under. And then I added these two Mr. U containers for science, of course, and as our little landing gear. Um, and here it is out on the runway, and it's time to test out to see if that little landing gear idea actually works. The parts tend to be a little bit tougher in KSP-1, so you can kind of get away with stuff like this, but uh, obviously something was wrong here. Uh, planes usually don't do that. So we're going to take and adjust our center of lift to about equal to our center of mass there. Right now it's behind it, and I'm doing this because as we burn through fuel, the center of mass is actually going to shift forward, and then our center of lift is going to be behind it still. So right now it actually is going to be pretty unstable on takeoff, so I'm going to be very, very gentle on the stick and make sure that we don't flip out of control. But I do get it off the ground just fine, <laughs> believe it or not, and we're able to uh, get it up to a pretty fair altitude. Now, as we burn through fuel and that center of mass shifts forward, we're going to have to flip it around like this and use the drag of our uh, landing gear to uh, keep us nose up. We're going to take our landing gear and do some science with them. And uh, we got a little science report there for seven science that we should hopefully be able to get back home. And please pay no mind to the floating trees back there. I have absolutely no idea what Parallax was up to. Um, but anyway, we're going to try to land this softly in the water and we run into a bit of a problem. Yeah, the center of mass problem where it shifts forward was a little bit stronger than I had anticipated. So we're going to revert the flight and shift the wings even farther forward on this version and put a vertical stabilizer on there. Yeah, we'd actually uh, forgot to put one on the last one and since we're using the uh, reaction wheels to control this thing anyway, it was just keeping it completely stable in the aisle. We also turned down our thrust a little bit to below one. And so we're able to take off just like a plane, even with below one thrust to weight ratio, proving that this is indeed a plane. We also took a crew report over top of uh, Kerbin's shores there. I forgot to do that last time. We're going to try to milk as much science out of this as possible. This is flying much, much better this time. And I was even able to uh, buzz one of the new harbors that one of the mods I have added. Uh, we'll be able to do boats. That would be pretty cool. And uh, now we're going to try to fly it back as close to uh, the KSC as we can possibly get it. It's not going to really help anything, I just wanted to fly it around a little bit. Yeah, as you notice, we might we have to uh, actually land this upside down, and that's because of how draggy those landing gear are. So they're only our takeoff gear, not our landing gear. Um, we're going to go ahead and do all of our science here in the water, get uh, Jebediah out, have him do an EVA report, and then he'll go grab all the science, bring it back in, and then we can do all the reports again. Classic KSP-1 science tomfoolery here. <laughs> He just goes in and out, grabs all the reports, and then we're able to do them again. We did have a small problem, though. The goo escaped into the water. Yeah, that's definitely going to be a natural disaster in the making. But we don't care about killing Kerbin. We care about the science. So we're going to recover this, and we got a pretty hefty chunk of science. 31 science on our very first mission. That's pretty good. And a ton of funds from all the world records we apparently broke. 
but we didn't get our mission for launching our first vessel, which is pretty weird. But we're going to go on a shopping spree anyway. We decided to pick up the very next node that has science in it. That is always a smart move. Pick up the uh, node that has the thermometer in it, and uh, then you can uh, get even more science to unlock even more stuff. Aviation is going to cost us 45 science, though, so we're going to start grinding toward that. One of the nodes we picked up had these much bigger uh, little uh, winglets in it, and they actually give us slightly more lift than three of the smaller winglets combined. So we're going to completely replace it with those, and we're going to go to the island runway this time, because we get a completely separate science biome there. And it's not much science, but at this early in a career stage, it actually helps out quite a lot. But now we're going to take it off, now that we gathered all of this, and try to get either some science from the mountain above the uh, island runway, or from the waters out here yet again, but this time with our thermometer and stuff. So uh, we take off just the same as usual, except this time we've got a little bit more lift, and we start doing some science immediately. And I was going to try to land it in the mountains, but I quickly decided uh, that one, we had way too much fuel and we needed to burn it a little bit longer, and two, it would be kind of hard to land this thing on solid ground. Yeah, that might be a bit of a problem. And I didn't want to really use the parachute unless absolutely necessary, so now that we're out of fuel, we kind of needed to make a choice. I tried to fly over toward the runway, but uh, ended up landing in the water instead. And it was a beautiful glide down to the water, though. Um, it's actually fairly easy to fly this thing, even though it has absolutely no control surfaces. You'd be pretty surprised. Um, but we came out down for an even softer landing than last time. Uh, I mean, as soft as you can have with absolutely no control surfaces or any landing gear whatsoever. And we go ahead and flip it over so we can do all of our science down in the water and get Jeb out to gather all the other science and put it all back together. Yeah, it's the, it's the KSP-1 science stuff, you know, you get out of the cockpit, you grab all your reports, so then you can do the reports again, otherwise you can't, and then you get back in the cockpit, and you end up with something like this. We have 37 science now, but for some reason we still haven't completed the mission to launch your first vessel. So I decided to uh, kind of uh, crank the thrust limiter all the way up, which now has a 7.5 thrust to weight ratio, and that seemed to do the trick. I think it had something to do with us taking off too horizontally, so for some reason it just wasn't recognizing that as taking off at all. And there goes Jeb going well over supersonic right there, and we're going to try to actually glide out to that other piece of land just north of the KSC. So, uh, it didn't really work out for us. As we got closer and closer to the shore, I was beginning to think we might actually make it to that biome, but we stalled out just short of it and kind of destroyed the craft in the process. But the cockpit survived, and that's all that really matters. So we went ahead and recovered it and got our contract completed. Um, now we just uh, go through and uh, collect all of the uh, debris that I left behind from the crash, and then we're going to go into the mission control and get a new mission. Now we've got a bunch of new missions to choose from. There's a test for the Juno jet engine and a test for the swivel uh, rocket engine. And we're going to go ahead and just slap both of those onto our craft. This is what I came up with. And run the test on the runway. You simply just put it on the runway and click run test. And uh, well, it runs the test and you get the contract. Um, it's actually a cool way to get parts early if you don't have them unlocked, but they didn't actually give us an area in tech with that Juno, so it was kind of useless. We now have 44 science though, which is just one short of getting the Juno for good, and to try to get that extra science, we're going to do this contract to fly a radial drug shoot out to a certain altitude and speed, which I think our little fly can handle just fine. So we go ahead and take it off, and the second we get to the correct altitude and speed, I'm going to kill everything and just to activate our parachutes because I don't want to take any chances on not completing this mission since we're so close to getting actual jet engines. So we go ahead and activate all of those parachutes and surprisingly we come in for the most perfect vertical landing ever. Isn't that cute? So we're going to go ahead and recover this and we got 47.6 science now which is just enough to get the aviation tree with landing gear, an actual cockpit, jet engines, everything that we need. So we went ahead and picked that up and began work on our very first actual plane. And this is what I'm so excited for in this series because I cut my teeth building planes in KSP-1 after all, and this is where I'm most comfortable doing it. We're gonna have access to propellers as we go on and all kinds of crazy stuff. And we'll be able to make planes for every imaginable planet or place that we can think of. It's gonna be really fun. So we're gonna build a very basic plane here with uh, two Juno engines on the wingtips and a, a VTOL design, so we don't have to uh, add extra weight and drag to this. Um, and we gotta use those 
landing gear. I hate these landing gears so, so much, but that is all we have access to right now. They're non-retractable, they're pretty draggy, but uh, they're gonna have to work. We're gonna add our ailerons there, and we're actually gonna add two of those ailerons uh, together, deploying in opposite directions to act as air brakes for us. And we will definitely need it because the brakes are way, way, way too light for, uh, for how heavy this plane is. So uh, we're going to name this the SO1 Cicada. I'm just going to name everything SO1, SO2, and so on as we go on. And then we're going to add all of our science parts to this, which is just the thermometer and a mystery goo container. And then a few finishing touches, like an antenna, and then some navigational lights that will blink red and green and clear, just to make it look that much better. So we're going to turn those uh, red and green and white and everything, and we are officially done with the SO1 Cicada. We're going to go ahead and grab some contracts for it. This one's for landing a plane in the mountains with some very specific criteria on how we should do it. And the other one is just building our first plane. Here it is on the runway on its first takeoff test, and it is working beautifully. We have a, some nice IVA mods here that are going to give us beautiful, beautiful IVAs that are fully interactable. The screens all can load up whatever we want on them. And as we go on, we'll unlock more and more on these screens, and we'll start adding cameras and stuff. Uh, so this would be really, really cool. You can see the heads-up display there is awesome. And here it is, taking off from the runway. Very, very nice flyer. This thing flew amazingly and was really, really stable despite being a VTAIL. I usually don't have that much luck with VTAILs, not VTOLs, VTAILs. Um, and they tend to do kind of stuff like this, but uh, this was easily recoverable to uh, uh, to get it back in line with the yaw and everything. And it, it flew really, really well, actually. So uh, we're going to fly this out to the mountains and decide to uh, whip out the 4K recording for our little flight right here since this is our first true jet aircraft in the series. Uh, I figured that it deserved this. For only having two Juno engines, I was incredibly surprised at just how fast this thing was going. It was, it was actually able to pass up 300 meters per second, which is just around 30, uh, 30 meters per second from actually going supersonic already. So it's already got some transonic uh, vapor effects there uh, around it, which are pretty darn cool. And uh, we flew over to the mountains. Our goal is to fly over to the mountains. We have to fly to, I think it was 3,000 uh, meters in hold for like five minutes. And so we spun around in a circle over top of the mountains here and then now our goal is just to land so we're going to activate our air brakes for the first time to try to slow ourselves down because this thing is incredibly aerodynamic surprisingly and it really just gains speed as you drop so it's not going to really uh, uh slow down on landing unless we have those air brakes out but the air brakes at the same time are a little bit too effective so it drops our speed incredibly fast so we have to uh keep our engines activated and uh kind of a mess with the throttle which i have actual throttle control in ksp1 now full flight stick control so it's going to be even easier to fly these things but uh as you can see uh not quite as easy as i would want um so we're going to try that again um with another run and we've got our two little uh, air brakes there pulled up and we went ahead and disabled them and come in for a fairly soft landing given that we're having to land with the crappiest landing gear available in a very fairly rough terrain here and as always i tried to avoid hitting actually hitting the trees and stuff even though i don't have collision turned on for those right now and now we're just going to go ahead and activate those air brakes to continue slowing down because the brakes are very very weak for how heavy this plane is and we stopped um so if you're wondering why i'm activating those uh air brakes uh, manually it's because we don't actually have action groups unlocked yet we got to upgrade some buildings to do that we completed our uh, mission, so now it's just a matter of getting all the science from the mountains bound. So we get Jeb out and have him do an EVA report. And here we are, land in the mountains. We're not actually going to fly it back. I'm just going to recover it from right here so we can get right back into the next mission. So we got a pretty fair haul from that. We're already at almost 250,000 funds, which is really, really great. Uh, our reputation's looking good, and we got a good bit of science. So we're going to go ahead and unlock the barometer, which is the biggest thing in that note, I would say. And then go ahead and grab some rocket parts because eventually we are going to need to use some rocket engines. We're going to grab two new contracts. This one's to fly an airplane to 5,000 meters, and then this one is to go 100 meters per second, which we have well blown out of the water. We're going to go ahead and add our barometer and a Kerbal Engineer part there uh, so we can use our Kerbal Engineer uh, Redux uh, menu there. Here's our IVA of us throttling up and taking off. It's 
absolutely beautiful. I might be flying a lot of these missions in AVA. Let me know if you would love some more AVA views of the flats and stuff like this. I'm not that good at landing in AVA as of right now, so I'd like to get a lot better at that as a uh, as the series goes on. Something else that I'm actually looking forward to is that we have a probe control room installed too, and that's going to allow us to actually uh, fly probes and look at the cameras and stuff that we install on them uh, from a little probe control room and stuff. It's going to uh, add to the immersion of it, if you would. We're going to go ahead and get some science while we're up here though, and uh, we've already completed both of our missions, so we're going to go ahead and turn around and head back to the KSC. Now, we are actually going to land it at the runway. This will be the first landing at the runway that we're going to be doing. And luckily, this thing is still holding up pretty good and flying well. So uh, I was able to zoom in inside of our AVA here and uh, find the runway and line up with it. We also actually have uh, waypoints for all of the runways and different sides across Kerbin that we have now. We have Kerbin side installed, so we have runways across Kerbin so we can fly different routes between them and maybe even start an airlines if we want to do that. We're going to get both of our air brakes ready and line up here. No promises on how the uh, flight's going to go because uh, I'm not quite used to flying things with my flight stick in KSB1 quite yet. And the landing gear suck. I'm going to completely blame, blame the landing gear though. That's definitely what was causing me to porpoise there. And it wasn't me at all. So uh, <laughs> we do eventually come to a stop eventually though. And like I said, we've got a pretty big fuel load in this plane and those brakes are pretty crappy. So it's a pretty long rollout. So we went ahead and recovered that and we got a little bit of science and we got a whole bunch of funds. We're now at 271,000 funds and when I went into mission control, we found this mission, which sounds a lot more exciting, breaking the sound barrier. And I think it might just be possible with the aircraft that we have right now. We're just going to need to adjust it a little bit and make a sport model, so the SO-1S Cicada. So we're going to go ahead and streamline it and take everything that we've added to it off all of those little uh, science parts and stuff, leave the navigational lights, and we're going to let a bunch of fuel out of this thing so it's a lot lighter. So we can't go as far, but hopefully we're going to be able to go a lot faster. We're already getting up to like 310 meters per second. The sound barrier is 343 meters per second at sea level. So uh, I'm hoping we'll be able to just barely make it to the sound barrier. So we need to actually fly completely level into sound barrier so we can't actually dive. I'm sure we could get the sound barrier by diving, uh, but it turns out that we got right up just to the edge of breaking the sound barrier to 337 meters per second within 10 meters per second of breaking it, but we just couldn't do it. So we're going to add yet another Juno engine to this thing, making it a try engine uh, aircraft and we're going to add it to the bottom here and then kind of move it back to the tail segment so we don't hit it whenever we're uh, we're landing so it's going to be pretty low down there but uh, it's going to give us just a little bit of extra thrust hopefully just enough to push this over the edge and make it break the sound barrier so we had even easier time taking off this time because now we have a whole bunch of engines and what do you know we actually ended up breaking the sound barrier on the climb up to 3,000 meters so, uh, wow, uh, this thing actually is a lot better than I even thought it would be with three engines. So the sport model now can go a little bit over uh, supersonic. It can cruise at around Mach 1.04 right there. We actually have a Mach number indicator there next to the thing and a vertical speed indicator. So that's pretty cool. Here's a cool flyby bot. And as you can tell, we were clearly going supersonic. So now we're going to turn this around and fly it back to the KSC. I was in a hurry to get back to the KSC though, so uh, we kind of overshot it a little bit. So we had to do a quite aggressive approach. Our air brakes did almost two Gs of de deceleration on us, and then we're going to just nosedive down toward the ground. These air brakes are actually so effective on this when it's completely light that it actually slows down as it falls, and I wasn't quite certain what the terminal velocity was. It was definitely well under 100 meters per second, though. I was going to shoot for landing around uh, 60 meters per second because that's a pretty good number to land at. Um, we ended up going a little bit below that, and we still porpoised up and down the runway. Still not that good at landing. Hopefully I'll improve as the series goes on like I did with the KSP2 series. At least I think I did. Um, but this mission was so exciting that it actually made Jeb kind of feel something. He danced for at least one second. I have no morals or belief system. I have no spirituality or anything that gives my life meaning or structure. With Jeb's existential crisis out of the way, we're going to check in to see what other missions we have now. And it looks to be that the next one is going to be escaping the atmosphere. That's going to be pretty interesting. 
So we're going to be doing that one in the very next episode. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to be continuing the KSP2 series very soon. We're just going to be playing this for a little while because this is very, very exciting. And I can't wait to see what we come up with in KSP1 with the power of mods on our side. Thank you so much for watching, though. Let me know if you want more. This is Smoonie Chad, out.